Our scripture reading this morning is in Corinthians, 13th chapter, the 13th verse, and it's one that we all know well. So faith, hope, love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. This morning, Dale, when you're telling the children's story, I was wondering if you're telling my story. So I couldn't, that's what my wife was telling me. She thought it sounded very familiar. So, <clears throat> yeah, well, I was riding and getting in her driveway and getting a wood rail fence, crushing my throat, breaking my jaw. So that's why I talk this way. Uh, my sermon title. Can you guys hear me okay? What? Yeah, I did. Okay. I just want to make sure because my voice is so soft that if it's not working, you guys can't hear me. So probably going to wonder about my sermon title and think after reading that scripture that it's wrong, but I've got a reason for changing the order. So have fun discussing. How are you guys dealing with things this year? Past year has been interesting, hasn't it? All the COVID stuff. Yeah. Have things gotten better? I see some of both, maybe. Yes, no. Bear with me with my introduction here. I've got a point. With, have you noticed that there seems to be a lot of contradictions about COVID? Seems like, I don't know if I personally could trust what people believe. I don't care who it is. Seems like opposites. I mean, first it was slow the spread to don't get it at all. And we've had discussions over should we wear a mask or no mask? Is it dangerous or is it not dangerous? Do we take the vaccine or not? That's a current one, isn't it? Do we force people to take the vaccine or not? To me, it seems like there's some sort of confirmation bias to, to a large degree, which is, I mean, I had a friend who I was talking to, I think last, you know, a while back, and she was just so extremely afraid of the coronavirus and the likelihood of anything bad happening to her was small. It seems like it depends on my observation is that our view is taken from our experience. If you have family members or friends who die from it, then maybe you point out stories of people dying and you're scared. But if you don't have that experience, you point out stories of people living and you're not so scared. Kind of depends. What do you believe? Last year when I gave this sermon, I had this nice little slide about the time change. You know, I don't want to change the clock back because I don't want an extra hour of 2020. Are you guys feeling that same way for 2021? That's why I left it in here. So my point, how has this all affected your beliefs? Your faith, what about faith and beliefs of people in authority in the government? Has it increased, decreased? Now we can't just leave this at home. We've got, it comes with us when we come to church. So, how is our beliefs affected to our spiritual lives and how things are at church? What is hope? Maybe it could be defined as something we like to argue about. You're looking at me strange. But take a look at your favorite football team or favorite 
baseball team or soccer team or whatever. And you can see the point, right? It's something we like to argue about. My football team is better than your football team. Just ask me, I'll tell you. What about kids? Do you have hope for your kids? Have a good marriage, have a good life, stay in church. So what is hope? First Thessalonians 4, Paul says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest, who have no hope. So if we don't grieve like the rest who have no hope, and then the next text, which is not there, starts out, for if we believe, verse 14. So hope is belief. It's when you believe in something. So if you stop believing, you've lost hope. If you've lost hope, you've stopped believing. If you don't have hope, you don't believe. They kind of work together. So the question is, do you still believe? Jesus said, all things are possible to those who believe. With your favorite football team, sports team, do you lose hope in your team if you believe in them? I don't know how successful your teams are. Maybe we should take a poll and find out who's got the favorite football team around. And then you can start say, asking the question, how are they doing so far this year? But at the beginning of every year, you are full of hope, are you not? They made some moves in the off season. They're going to be much better this year. And when it gets too late to where there's no hope, well, there's always next year. They'll do better. We live for the hope. If we can be this silly over sports, what can we do with things that matter? With your kids, do you have hope for your kids? They'll be better people. They'll come to Christ. They'll stay with Christ. If you're losing hope, you're losing because you're stopping your believing process. Well, I've been discouraged recently. Maybe you say, I've been harboring doubt. There's that saying. As long as we're harboring doubt, we start to lose hope because we stop believing. And it's easy to start losing hope, to start doubting. Situations happen. It's easy to blame others our pastor, our elder, our deacon, our church member, our boss, world events, sin, COVID. I would kind of make the argument that we need to probably take a little more responsibility for our doubts and do more about it. Like pray, change how we think, making better choices. would like to make a point here too that if any of you are driving people away if you're on that side of the equation you need to repent stop doing that we need to bring people to god not drive them away my travels as auditing or reviewing local church books i met a, tr a husband treasure's husband and he wasn't sure he believed in God anymore. Because there's too much bad 
happening in the world. It's telling me, I just seen so many bad things happening. Maybe God might have exist, but I don't know. I really didn't know how to answer, to be honest. But it all begins with hope. Stop looking for reasons to doubt. It's a choice. Look for reasons to believe. There's evidence there. You just have to choose what you focus on. If you don't have members wanting to come to your church, do you still believe? Well, I have my doubts. See, it's easier in third world countries. They've got better results, right? But how dare we try to tell the Holy Spirit what is possible and what is not possible. God is looking for people who believe. So what can we do to look for reasons to believe that God can still work here through us? An amazing thing that we see is that God can take broken people like us and still accomplish a divine thing. The Holy Spirit can do all things if only we believe. How many things? Well, most things are impossible or most things are possible, right? Is that what it says? No. All things are possible. And the question is, do you believe? Are we willing to let God finish his work and use us in the process? All things are possible to those who believe. Do you believe? In Mark 9, a man was brought a demon-possessed son to Jesus to be healed. Jesus was up on the mountain and wasn't there. The disciples tried and failed. What do you think happened to that guy's doubt or that guy's belief in the process over this? Do you think doubt started coming in? I couldn't see any other way except this guy would be doubting. If the disciples can't do it, how can Jesus? When he met Jesus, Jesus said, well, actually, the man came to Jesus and he said, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can. What do you mean, if? Everything is possible for the one who believes. And what was the response of the father? Immediately, the father of the boy cried out, I do believe. Help me in my unbelief. I believe. Help me in my unbelief. Give me my full belief. I think sometimes we need to pray that prayer more often for ourselves. I do. So why couldn't the disciples do this? Why could they not bring healing? Verse 28 says, after he'd gone into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? And he told them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer. So if you're having a hard time believing, if you're having a hard time with doubts, with hope. And we need to be a little bit more praying. We spend too much time arguing, not enough time praying. And we need to pray the same prayer. Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. So what is faith? This is not necessarily a trick question for you. So what is faith? Hebrews 11, 1. 
Now faith is the reality of what is what? Hoped for the proof of what is not seen. So faith is the reality or the substance of hope. What is hope? Hope is when you believe in something. You can't have faith unless you believe in something. Do you believe? I looked up in the dictionary and it says faith is a noun. I kind of like to change that and say that we need to see faith as a verb, an action. Faith is a response to the conviction that you believe in something. If you don't believe in something, no wonder you've lost your faith. If you've lost hope, no wonder there is nothing to put your faith upon. Faith is when you do what you believe. Faith is when you do what you believe. Hope leads to faith. Faith is what you do when you what is. Faith is when you do what you hope for. It's kind of like a muscle. What happens if you don't exercise? How do you feel if you overwork? Is it pleasant? Yeah, probably not. But muscles grow when they face resistance. Muscles need resistance. So if you're jogging or weightlifting, is that enjoyable? Maybe to some, it's not to me. And when you do it, do you smile when you do this exercise? I don't know, see these weightlifters now. Do they actually smile when they're trying to lift these weights? I see them making faces, right? Uh, no, it's not fun. But what happens if you do it? What happens? You get bigger, leaner, stronger. So what about faith? You know, faith grows when you experience resistance. So what is the resistance in faith to give us strong muscles here? It's trials. How many of you had trials? Anybody? Oh, is it enjoyable? I don't know if you're like James here, where James basically says, consider it a painful experience whenever you experience various trials. Is that what it says? That's the way we think of it, right? And yet James 1 says, consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Verse four says, let endurance have its full effect so you may be mature and complete. Do you smile during trials? I sure don't. It's kind of like exercising. But the power of resistance is that it brings faith and sight. There's those of us who become weak in faith, who have lost hope and belief, and that's why they don't use their faith. And on the day they need strength, they don't have the strength. We become weaklings in the faith because we're not exercising our faith. Resistance needs to be viewed with new eyes. And because we suffer, someone else might actually be strengthened. If you don't use your muscles, what happens? Don't they atrophy? They get weak, they get smaller. They're Christians whose faith have become atrophied. Well, if he was only a God of love, he would never permit 
If only you believed in something and had some hope, your faith would grow. Focus on the things to believe in, not on the things that don't. There's a story about this lady who's in Los Angeles where she lived. Her son was in a car. And the car drove up. Somebody in that car shot and killed her son. Died. Funeral, number one. Not too much longer later, somebody came into her house to their daughter's bedroom, which is just down the hall, and killed her daughter in her bed. Second funeral. They owned a junkyard. They had a good sized truck, I guess. It was on an incline. That the husband forgot to set the parking brake. He ended up getting out of his truck, walking down the hill, did not see the truck come down. And then it ran over him and killed him. What do you think this woman's reaction was to this? I would have a tough time, okay? I really would. Her reaction was comforting others during her grief. Where does this kind of faith come from that you can comfort others when you are grieving over your kids and your husband? Pastor went to visit this lady. I guess there's a deacon in the church who's giving him a hard time. And pastor was having a challenge. She comforted the pastor. So come here. Let's go pray to God and have God just go and mess him up. And when she prayed, she said, Lord, stop this guy and bring him to repentance. Save him and let him be instrumental in saving other people. How do you still have the ability to pray like that when somebody else is hurting you? But during these trials that she had, it strengthened her faith. Unmerited suffering is redemptive. I will say it's not easy to do. Doing the right thing when suffering, we need to do it the most when we feel like it the least. Don't complain about your problems. Become a better person because of it. So the question is, do you have faith? Yes or no? We're all different and better because of our differences. We need a final movement of people who have hope because they believe in something and believe in each other. We are needing a final movement of people of faith who allow their faith to grow bigger and stronger because they look at trials with new eyes. Unmerited suffering is redemptive. Faith in action is basically show me, not just tell me. What is love? Love is when you give of yourself to someone else. How I many have ever dated somebody and broke up with them or they broke up with you or something like that? For anybody who's been married, you probably had that experience before you got married, right? How did you break up? I guess when I was growing up, we didn't have cell phones too much. And so would you call the person up to break up with them? Probably not the best etiquette. Do you text them today and say, I'm sorry, we need to break up? Is that the best way? If you cared for them at all, you do it face to face. Bible also says a greater love is when you lay down your life for other people. It's not easy. 
sometimes I think it's easier to die for somebody than it is to live for somebody, to be honest. All right, now I'm going to ask you a trick question. All right, I know the answer you're going to give me. What is the love chapter of the Bible? Nobody wants to answer this one. Okay, 1 Corinthians 13 is not the correct answer, okay? That's the answer we say, but I'm going to try to change things up on you, all right? So if 1 Corinthians is not the love chapter, what is the love chapter? I'm going to make you think here. Come on. Be involved. What? Okay. Nice try. Thinking hard. I can see it. Okay, I'll have mercy on you not to stay too long trying to come up with an answer. How about saying that Exodus 20 and maybe Deuteronomy 5 is the left chapters of the Bible? And then you're going to say, ah, what on earth are you talking about? But think about it. Yes, these chapters are basically where God gives the Ten Commandments. And they're taken as commands because it's given to people used to being given commands. Right? In Luke 10, a lawyer approached Jesus and asked for the greatest commandment. And what did Jesus say? Good, I get to hear myself. The greatest commandment, Jesus said, was love God and love those made in the image of God. The first four commandments are the definition of the intensity of love. The last six commandments are a definition of loving people made in the image of God. So what is 1 Corinthians 13 of Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5 of the love chapters? Now, I'm going to try to change your perspective a little bit, but I've been introduced to the idea that 1 Corinthians 13 is actually the hypocrisy chapter. And you guys are going to look at me crazy. The hypocrisy chapter. Yeah. Because 1 Corinthians 13 describes how to live a hypocrisy-free life. And we're going to describe hypocrisy as doing the right things without the right reasons. Doing the right things without love. So let's take a look at this. 1 Corinthians 13, if I speak human or angelic tongues but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clinging symbol. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faiths so I can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions and if I give over my body in order to boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. So the first three verses, if you don't have love, what do you have? Nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It's not boastful, not arrogant. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not irritable and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away, I put aside childish things. 
For now we see only reflection as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. We're still childish in our thinking. We need to grow up. We need to move beyond that. And in verse 13, and these things remain faith, hope, and love. But the greatest is love. We need to remember that God made us with feelings. See, people won't always remember your words. We're going to go home and you're probably not going to remember much that I say here today, except that maybe 1 Corinthians 13, the hypocrisy chapter. Maybe. But people will remember how they feel. People will come to church because they feel welcome. People will stay because they feel like a member of the family. For those of you who are married, why are you married? If you've been married long enough, maybe you're saying, well, I don't know anymore. But you married your spouse because of how that person made you feel. You have two broken people who have come together. An amazing thing. You've chosen to live together, to stay together. After you be married a little while, maybe you might say something like, I still love you, but I wish you were dead. Being married is a choice. You'll go through times that are hard. It's not always fun and games and easy. Loving others is also a choice. It's not just a feeling. So if I ask the question, why hasn't Christ come yet? What is he waiting for? What would our answer be? We've wasted so many years fighting amongst ourselves. The work hasn't gotten finished. We fight over the conference. We fight over the pastor, the budget, diet, dress, music, women's ordination, unity in the church. And you could probably list a few more. We need to stop wasting time. We're not bringing souls to Christ. That needs to be our focus. Stop wasting time. Start loving each other. So what is hope? It's when you believe in something. What is faith? It's when you do what you believe. And what is love? It's giving of yourself. It's sharing. And the greatest is love because it's the giving of yourself. And the others will fall into place when that happens.